This is the video for DE 3.3 on homeostasis, all of the standard level content. Homeostasis is one of those characteristics of living things, and it can be defined as the maintenance of stable internal conditions, regardless of fluctuations in the external environment. It seeks to keep many variables within a, sp a certain range. So examples in humans include uh, body temperature, blood pH, blood glucose concentration, osmotic concentration, all of those things that need to be kept within a narrow range. We'll be talking a lot about feedback loops, so let's quickly define the two types of feedback loops. Positive feedback loops are going to increase the distance between the current range and the original level. So what does that mean? Well, it's a driver of change. More of one thing leads to more of another thing, which leads to more of the first thing, which leads to more of the other thing. If you've already studied some of the hormones of the menstrual cycle, that should sound familiar to you. Negative feedback loops, however, are the type of feedback loops that we'll be talking mostly about in homeostasis. These are going to promote stability by returning values back to the original range. So what does that mean? Well, if one variable goes beyond the acceptable range, mechanisms kick in to bring it back down or back up to that narrow range that those variables uh, must exist between. Now, all of these processes that um, deal with negative feedback loops use energy. And so that's a consequence of homeostasis, but it does allow organisms to utilize a wider range of habitats, right? So their outside environment can be um, within a much broader range, but they use energy and homeostatic mechanisms to keep their internal environment um, constant. We talked about the maintenance of glucose as being an example of homeostasis in humans, and now let's go into a little bit more detail on that. We'll be looking at an organ called the pancreas, and here's a picture of the pancreas. It is in the abdomen, and the pancreas has two different types of glands. It has exocrine glands. Exocrine glands secrete uh, substances through a duct. So there are cells in the pancreas that are on uh, or line a duct, and these cells produce enzymes that then travel through this duct into the small intestine, those digestive enzymes. However, the cells that we'll be talking about in the maintenance of glucose come or make up part of endocrine glands. Endocrine glands secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream. So it's very important, those two words, okay? We, when we hear endocrine glands, we wanna be thinking about hormones and that they travel through the bloodstream. There are two major hormones involved in glucose control. One is called glucagon, Glucagon is a hormone that comes from the alpha cells in the pancreas, and beta cells are going to secrete a different hormone called insulin. So we won't find those lining the duct, okay? Those will be in other areas of the pancreas, and you'll see them associated with blood vessels because, again, both of these hormones are going to travel through the bloodstream. When glucose levels are high, like maybe after a meal, the beta cells are going to secrete insulin. And insulin has a couple of different functions. One is that it opens up glucose channels in our body cells to allow for uptake. Higher level students, you may have already learned about glucose co-transporters, but the key here is that our cells are lined with channels and those channels for glucose are going to remain closed until insulin is present. So insulin binds to a receptor, it allows those channels to open, glucose moves from the blood into the cells, thereby lowering the glucose level in the blood. It also stimulates the conversion of glucose to glycogen. So remember, glycogen is a polysaccharide. We see this a lot in the liver, and it's made up of many glucose molecules connected together. Again, a great review opportunity. We see these 1,4 and 1,6 linkages. But anyways, if we're creating this glycogen molecule, then that is going to remove glucose from the blood, again, lowering the blood glucose levels. Okay, and that's going to continue until those glucose levels return to normal and we're within that narrow homeostatic range. When our blood glucose levels are too low, the alpha cells will secrete the hormone called glucagon. I remember it like this, 
When your glucose is gone, you secrete glucagon. Glucagon is going to stimulate the conversion of glycogen into glucose. So it will cause this glycogen molecule to be hydrolyzed, okay? So cut up into all of these individual glucose monomers. That glucose is then released into the blood, blood glucose levels go back up, and now we are in this homeostatic range. Let's do a quick summary of this process, shall we? So when we do something like eating, let's say, then our blood glucose is going to rise and it may go out of that homeostatic range. So this high levels of blood glucose is going to trigger the beta cells to produce insulin. Insulin is going to open those glucose or channels on cells, and it's also going to cause glucose to be converted into glycogen, and that will lower blood glucose levels so that we're back in this homeostatic range. During periods of fasting, then we might find that our blood glucose levels drop, okay? And so these low levels of blood glucose are going to cause our alpha cells in our pancreas to produce glucagon. Glucagon triggers the conversion of glycogen into glucose. Glucose is released back into the bloodstream and glucose levels rise until we're back in homeostatic range. This is exactly how a negative feedback loop works. Diabetes is a condition by which this insulin and glucose uh, control does not function properly. There are two types of diabetes that we're responsible for knowing about, um, and diabetes just in general is going to lead to chronically elevated blood, blood glucose levels, um, but these two types that we'll discuss work in different ways. Type 1 diabetes, we used to call that juvenile diabetes, but that's no longer the term, so try to use this one if you're used to that. Type 1 diabetes is when the immune system attacks the beta cells. It is what we call an autoimmune disease. Because the B cells are either dead or non-functioning, little or no insulin is being produced, so it's a lack of insulin. Type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, um, occurs when someone is still producing proper levels of insulin, but there's decreased sensitivity to that insulin. That happens when there is a lack of insulin receptors on cells. So normal glucose transmission looks about like this. So here's the cell. We should have an insulin receptor. That receptor is going to bind with that hormone insulin and that causes a glucose transporter membrane protein to open. Glucose would enter. Well, in type two diabetes, there's a decreased sensitivity because they lack these insulin receptors. Without the receptors, these channels remain closed and glucose levels remain high in the blood because no glucose is able to enter that cell. This is not autoimmune. This is something that we used to call adult onset diabetes, but again, try to use the correct term. It links to things like lifestyle, so poor diet, lack of exercise, and there are also genetic components as well. Because there are different causes, the treatments for type 1 and type 2 diabetes are very different. So remember in type 1 diabetes, this is caused by a lack of insulin production due to the death of those beta cells. So for treatment, you would want to inject insulin. Of course, you would want to time that and test your blood sugar levels to make sure that you're injecting insulin at proper levels and at proper times. In type 2 diabetes, you won't find insulin injections as part of the treatment plan because there is already plenty of insulin, it's just there's a decreased sensitivity. So the treatment for type 2 diabetes should include changes to your diet to avoid huge spikes in blood glucose levels and plenty of exercise. Now let's move on to another example of homeostasis in humans, which is thermoregulation. So thermo referring to heat or temperature. And this is going to involve two types of thermoreceptors. So we'll have peripheral thermoreceptors. Periphery means on the outside. So these are in our skin. And central thermoreceptors on the inside of our body are going to monitor and predict temperature changes. 
inside of our brain, this very important structure called the hypothalamus, that's, that's right here. It, it's attached to the pituitary here, but we're going to focus on the hypothalamus deep here in the brain, is going to monitor and interpret the information from those ther thermoreceptors. And based on that information, we'll initiate a response. That response includes a few hormones uh, that we'll be using abbreviations for. TRH stands for thyrotropin releasing hormone. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroxine, which is a hormone that is going to increase the cellular metabolism, which is really closely linked to the rates of cell respiration. So let's talk about how this all works together. The hypothalamus is going to secrete TRH. So that comes from the hypothalamus and it goes to the pituitary. The, that is going to trigger the pituitary to produce TSH. TSH will then travel to a gland called the thyroid. Okay, so let me write that more clearly here. And that's a gland um, situated right in this area in your neck. That thyroid is going to release that th thyroxine hormone, and that is going to travel um, throughout the bloodstream to the entire body. That hormone will increase the rates of cellular metabolism, specifically respiration. One of the byproducts of respiration is that it produces heat, and that heat can then be used to increase the body temperature. Now, we know that those endocrine glands, remember those are the ones producing the, the hormones, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the thyroid, those are all involved in temperature control or thermoregulation, but they aren't the only ones. Muscle tissue can also be helpful in controlling our body temperature. So contractions of those muscles will generate heat. Muscle contractions need ATP. ATP requires cell respiration. Cell respiration produces heat. And then we have our adipose tissue. So adipose tissue is made out of fat cells and those fat cells, okay, with all this adipose tissue here, does a couple of really cool things. First of all, it will insulate to prevent heat loss. Specifically, I'm thinking about this seal. This seal lives in water and water is a very good conductor of heat. So if this seal didn't have a lot of adipose tissue underneath of its skin, then a lot of its body heat would then be conducted away by the water that it's living in. So being a good insulator is a great um, uh, function of those fat cells. And then it can also be used as a respiratory substrate. It's not just glucose that you can use for cell respiration. You can also use fats, okay, found in the adipose tissue to um, go through this cell respiration process, which again is going to release heat. And this is a great example um, of thermoregulation in endothermic animals. So endothermic is the fancy way of saying uh, warm blooded, if you've ever heard of that. And this is going to be a special property of birds and mammals. This is the ability to use both behavioral and physiological changes to maintain body temperature. So for example, if you're running on a cold day, the reason why you still feel warm, even if it's cold outside, is that you have certain behaviors, okay, like shivering or contracting those muscles and physiological changes like the release of hormones or the burning of fat to help maintain your body temperature. In addition to that uh, shivering, that muscle contraction that generates heat, we'll also find the erection of hair. So these goosebumps, some people call them, that you get on your skin, those are to erect the hair to help trap warm air. Vasoconstriction is another physiological response to cold temperatures. Vaso refers to blood vessels. Constriction means to get smaller. And what this does is that it reduces the blood flow to your skin, keeping the blood in the warmer area in that core of your body. You may also find another physiological response to cold called uncoupled uh, respiration. So in respiration, the ultimate goal is to produce ATP, but not in uncoupled respiration. 
This is just respiration, not for the sake of ATP, but just to produce that heat energy. It is going to occur in what we call brown adipose tissue. So your adipose tissue or your fat tissue comes in a few varieties. So you have a white fat cell and that's going to in, um, include lots of um, storage of fat uh, or lipids. And then beige, which is kind of combination between white and then these brown fat cells. So the brown adipose tissue is the one involved in uncoupled reservation. It's brown because it's chock full of these mitochondria. And the mitochondria are there to increase the rates of cell respiration. Again, they're going to use a slightly de a different mechanism because they're not trying to produce ATP, um, only that heat. And again, remember in negative feedback loops, it's not just, oh, what do we do if values get too low and how do I bring them up? It's also about what happens if values get too high? What mechanisms are needed to bring that temperature back down? So when we are too hot, okay, when we are, our blood is at something higher than homeostatic range, we have a couple of different physiological uh, responses. So one is sweating. Okay, so water has a really high latent heat of vaporization. So when that water-based sweat is on our skin, it's able to absorb a lot of that heat energy before it evaporates. This again is controlled by the hypothalamus, which is deep in our brain. It's one of the responses um, to the information that it's getting from those thermal receptors. Now, in cold temperatures, we found vasoconstriction. In hot temperatures, you will see vasodilation of the blood vessels in the skin. So again, vaso meaning blood vessel, dilation meaning get bigger. So this will increase blood flow to the skin. This is why when you're hot, your skin may take on a reddish color. That's the, the blood making its way to the skin, and it's doing that to better come in contact with the cooler air to try to help cool down the body. So we wanna be thinking about homeostasis, um, making sure that we're maintaining a st stable internal environment regardless of changes in the outside, and we wanna keep our eye on those negative feedback loops.